Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God slept, swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that, was, that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that, that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. And God brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, 
and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And, and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude and on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reading Psalm 8 responsively by half verse. O Lord, our governor, out of the mouths of infants and children, you have set up a stronghold against your adversaries. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you should be mindful of him? You have made him but little lower than the angels. You give him mastery over the works of your hands. All sheep and oxen, the, wild beasts of the, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. And walks in the of the sea. O Lord, our governor, is your name in all. a reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Finally, brothers and sisters, Farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one holy and undivided Trinity, one God. Amen. Amen. It's Trinity Sunday, the shortest sermon of the church year. <laughs> I've got a short one for you today. So, uh, the best sermon title for Trinity Sunday that I found in my research. Blah, 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 love. <laughs> blah, 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 love. It's all you need to know about the Trinity. So I was also talking to uh, Jill Stewart, our office administrator, and she was telling me about um, Chase Smith, who was a youth minister here at uh, at St. Philip's, and uh, Rob Field, in his wisdom, asked him to preach on Trinity Sunday. Very, very smart move. Abby, wherever you are, wait till next year, right? So anyway, Chase Smith, uh, he asked around, he spoke to all of his mentors about what to say, um, his teachers, what do I say about the Trinity? And one of them said, well, just hold up a cat picture, a cute cat picture. So I have lots of cute cat pictures. <laughs> Trinity, but look at this. Or replace dog or baby or something else if, uh, if you need to, if you're not a cat lover. But all of the silliness is really a setup for my sermon for what is the Trinity all about but love and cats. So uh, the Trinity is a way that we describe our God who manifests love in everything. It's our way of talking about God. And to have love, you have to have relationship. So in the beginning was the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, between the Creator, the Christ, and the Sustainer, between the three and one and the one and three. These three persons of the Trinity are relationship. And out of that relationship of love, that dynamic flow of love and interdependence came all of us, and cats too. So a cute cat picture really does tell us a lot about the Trinity. It's the Trinity that created all of that. So um, as I sort of just mentioned, when we talk about the Trinity, we're really talking about humanity and our way of talking about God, our way of explaining this encounter that we have had with this God who comes to us in this dynamic force of love and relationship. We're seeking a way to talk about who we are when we talk about the Trinity. And so for this reason, I want to focus this morning um, on Psalm 8. I love this psalm. One of the reasons I love this psalm is I was a camp counselor one summer when I was in college, and this was the psalm that we used um, throughout the summer. 
to talk about young people growing in the midst of creation, God's creation. So I love this psalm, and I want to uh, read it to you again, but I'm going to read the version, the message version, the, the translation from Eugene Peterson um, in, the, in the message translation of the Bible. I've changed a few words, but sorry, Eugene, but um, it's basically the, the, the message version of it. So here is Psalm 8. God, brilliant governor, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. I look up at the macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with me? Why take a second look my way? Yet we've so narrowly missed being gods, bright with Eden's dawn light. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world, repeated to us your Genesis charge made us stewards of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deeps. God, brilliant governor, your name echoes around the world. This psalm, it's been said, is for stargazers and soul searchers. Those two things go together, don't they? When we look at God's magnificent creation, we often search our own souls for what's the meaning of all this? What's the meaning of my small life in the midst of this amazing creation of God? So this is a psalm um, that is called a chiasm. It, it, it's a certain form of a psalm that has parallel doxologies at the beginning and the end. Notice that it began in the same way that it ended. And then it, it um, builds up to a central idea. And then that central idea is sandwiched between more development of the idea. And so um, I want to start by talking about this uh, doxology that begins and ends the psalm. And um, if you were in the talk with Bill Livingston about the Trinity, he uh, had a few words to say about governor, that this was actually an idea that came from Roman governors and, and gave that idea of the empire as a part of who God was and the power relationship there. But I like to read the word governor instead like Anthony Trollope the great British novelist, who throughout Anthony Trollope's novels, his different characters refer to their father or to their boss as governor, governor. And this, is, this word governor is a British slang for a boss or a manager or a father, someone who is well regarded in the community and is the one who manages, who not only sets up, but manages the systems by which a family, a community, or a business runs. I think this is a great image for God, a great image for God, not just as Lord or sovereign, but the one who sets up and runs and manages our relationships with one another, but also has this wonderful sense of affection and deep respect that one would have for a parent. So our psalm begins and ends recognizing and praising God for being our governor. Then let's jump to the central point of the psalm. Those middle verses that give us an existential question. That question, why do you bother with me? Why take a second look my way? 
Who am I that you care for me, God? Or, or better yet, what kind of God are you that you would care about me? I think we can all relate to this question. We've all had moments in our lives when we've been so overwhelmed with the beauty of creation, the complexity of life, that we wonder who we are in the midst of it all. How is it that God cares about us? The interesting thing about this passage, this passage in Psalm 8, is so often when uh, we, in scripture, it refers, when it's talking about you, or even um, humanity, it's talking about a community, the nation of Israel, or the body of Christ, the church, it's talking in a plural sense. But in Psalm 8, this is actually an individual looking up at the stars and wondering, who am I? Having that moment of existential questioning. So then we have the two sections of the psalm that sandwich this existential question. And they refer, the, right before the question, it talks about God's work in the world. And right after the question, sort of responding and answering to the question, is our work, our calling, humanity's vocation in the world. So before the question, we have a description of God's work, this amazing work of creation and protection that our governor does. Hanging jewelry in the sky, as Peterson says. The silencing of the foes through a toddler's song. And then after the question is a description of humanity's work. We're given the Genesis charge to be stewards, to be caregivers, to be partners with God in governing the world. We are given that calling, that fundamental calling to be stewards of God's creation, what is domesticated, what is wild, what is flying in the sky and swimming in the sea. We have been invited to participate in God's work. We're called to help God in ordering and shaping and stewarding and caring for all of life on earth. And this work, this vocation, gives us the value and worth and dignity as God's partners. Answering this question, who am I? I'm God's partner in governing the world. So in our gospel lesson, we hear about the resurrected Christ's last moments with his disciples in John's gospel, I mean Matthew's gospel. And what does Jesus do? He renews the Genesis charge. You are to be partners with God in the remaking of the world. He gives them work to do, a vocation, a calling, to make disciples and baptize in the name of the Trinity, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Charles Reeb writes of this moment. He writes, at the end of Matthew, before Jesus ascends to the Father, Jesus' last words to his followers were not, go and find a comfortable church and have a covered dish dinner. His last words were not, go and sing the songs you love. Jesus didn't say, try to do some good every once in a while. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Jesus goes on to give a promise. I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. And that is the promise of of the Trinity. It's that promise of the relationship of love that was at the very beginning between God the creator, God the, the savior, and God the sustainer. We are, it's as if we're in the midst of that dynamic relationship of love that's ever expanding, ever holding, ever empowering us to be one with it. It's a ball 
of power and energy, and we're right in the midst of it. I will be with you always. The Trinity will be with us always because we are in the very midst of it. So what then does it mean to make disciples in the name of the Trinity? Too often the church thinks it's all about Jesus. It's all about helping people to get to know Christ, meet my Lord, and find salvation. And yes, that's certainly part of it. I can speak to you about my own personal relationship with Jesus and what it has meant to me and my faith, but to make disciples in the name of the Trinity is so much more than that, than an individual relationship with God. To make disciples in the name of the Trinity is to invite others into this dynamic power of God that holds up the entire cosmos. It invites people into an ever-expanding circle where everyone is welcome. To invite people into the, into the, the Trinity is to invite them into this Genesis charge, to partner with God in the remaking of the world, in the sustaining of the world, in making the world whole. To partner with God in building communities and institutions and nations that promote justice, freedom, and dignity, and blah, 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 love. To make disciples in the name of the Trinity is to invite people into a body, a body and relationship of love. And it is love that is poured out for the world. And cat pictures too. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Stand as you are able. Renew your faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people begin on page 12. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. 
Let us welcome summer and be like dew-crested seedlings bursting through the soil, giving thanks and praying for your guidance to care for and honor our mountain home, this earth and all of your creation. We pray for those who govern that they might be like mountain ridges living in harmony with valley streams, seeking peace and serving with compassion and justice. Like birds and winds carry seeds over soft, damp earth, dispersing them in new areas to germinate into generations of plants, grant that Bishop Jose, Elizabeth, and all your ministers spread your word. In our diocese, we pray for the Church of the Holy Spirit, Mars Hill, and the Church of the Advocate, Asheville. In our Anglican community, we pray for the Episcopal Anglican Province of Alexandria. We pray for the needs of those in prison and for those who work in prisons. Let the mountain mist awaken us to love, serve, and strive for unity in seeking God's will. And as the sunset on the summit fades into darkness, may we know peace and rest. Bless all new life. Give patience to those praying for conception. Comfort those unable to conceive. Strengthen those awaiting childbirth, especially Madison and Sam Benton, Delilah and Thomas Free Freeman, Lizzie Livengood, and Jessica and Kevin McKegg. We give you thanks for the promise of new life. We pray for all those who are sick or suffer in mind or body, that they may know the comfort of your healing breath. We pray for those who have died, especially Nancy Weir. Give those who mourn faith to know, redeemed by Christ, we are all raised into eternal life. We give thanks for the flowers at the altar, given to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for our Episcopal Church women, especially Lila Stewart and Carol Twiss, who are retiring from the shop of St. Philip's Board after many years of service. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another in the name of Christ. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Rolls, Rector 
uh, here at St. Philip's, and I'm so glad that you are worshiping with us today. Thank you for being here, especially if you are new among us or visiting. We're so glad that you are here. If you're joining us, worshiping at home on Facebook Live or on YouTube, streaming YouTube, we're so glad that you're here, um, and we hope you come back every Sunday. So thank you for being here. Um, are there any birthdays or anniversaries or other special occasions that we want to mark with prayer today? Birthday, Fred. Okay. There, oh, good, another birthday. Oh, even better. All right, another birthday. How exciting. Well, uh, you can look in the back of your bulletin to see who else is uh, celebrating birthdays or anniversaries this week, and we can just gather them up in our prayers. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Oh God, our times are in your hands. Look with favor on these who begin another year. Help them to grow each and every day of their lives in love and courage and strength. Help them to know that love of the Trinity that holds them, shapes them, forms them, and sends them into this world to make disciples and to build your kingdom. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. Enjoy. So a reminder that uh, uh, all who seek Christ are welcome to come forward and receive the bread and the wine made holy. If you would like to uh, dip your bread into the wine, receive by intinction, we call that, you can come here to the front rail. If you would like to sip from the chalice, um, you can do that um, at the back rail. If you would like to receive in your seat, you just simply let the uh, ushers know and we will bring communion to you. But remember, you're welcome to come, you're welcome to receive um, as we join together in this holy meal. Um, also remember that immediately following this service, we will have coffee hour over um, in our parish hall um, and you're welcome to come and continue the fellowship there. I want to give a special thanks and welcome to Charlotte Gilmore, who's back with us for the summer to play piano and organ. Thank you, Charlotte. And also to Sydney Windham, who is um, with us today helping lead our singing. She was with us at Christmas, and we're so glad that you are here today. Brittany Seaman, we're sharing her today uh, with... Um, Faith Chapel, always get it mixed up. I want to call it Grace Chapel, but it's Faith Chapel up in Cedar Mountain. So we're sharing Brittany. She's up there today um, offering her uh, talents to their worship service. So thank you, Sydney, for coming and being with us. So uh, this Thursday at 4 p.m., the ECW is um, uh, offering uh, a reception, having its quarterly meeting, um, and also uh, flower arranging. Even if you have not signed up for the flower arranging, or even if you don't want to do flower arranging, <laughs> you're still welcome to come. We're going to have a reception. It's going to be out on the patio um, outside of Miller Hall, so it's going to be lovely, um, and it'll be a nice time to come together and share fellowship. As others arrange flowers, you can just relax and enjoy um, some uh, refreshments on the patio. Um, you may have noticed that we have, uh, we're lacking our wonderful choir um, and going to miss them this summer, um, but we are also doing favorite hymns to make it a little bit easier for us to sing together. It's still time, you may have noticed, I think we sang one of my favorite hymns already this morning, um, and if you would like to uh, share your favorite hymn, if you haven't done that already, uh, we do have the list from past years, so we're, I'm working off of those lists, but if there's a new favorite hymn, or some, if you haven't uh, yet offered your favorite hymn, there's still time to do that. I think I still have uh, August to plan, so uh, get your suggestions in um, uh, soon so that we can, let's see, it's June 30th is our deadline, um, so that we can uh, sing all of our favorite hymns this uh, summer. And now, my friends, hear these words of Scripture. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, 
which is your spiritual worship. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time, you made ready the creation, your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that, that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing.
and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine, and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth, and make us your new creation the body of Christ, given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with Philip and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God of promise, you have prepared a banquet for us. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thank you. 
Our post-communion prayer is on page 20 of your bulletin. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Let us go forth in the name of the Trinity. Thanks. Thanks.